Okay, last week, well, you decided to come back, huh? Come back all the way back from America, did you? Oh, goodness. Before I forget, I need to visit with you after, after church. For a little bit. If, if you check, check your calendar. Don't do like I did last time we scheduled something and forget. So... That's why I said it now while I'm, while I'm remembering. Last week, we were uh, kind of looking at the, the two problems that seem to, to show up in the book of Revelation. One is uh, the, the issue of, of compromise, and the other was the issue of uh, affliction. And so this morning, I want us to look a little more at some of the evidence uh, about the compromise that we see in in the book of Revelation. But be, before I get into that, I just kind of feel like I need to ask, does anybody have any questions about what we talked about last week that, that, that's that been pressing on your minds before we move on? Okay, good enough. So, uh, no. Yes, ma'am. How did you come to the I listen to these preachers, other mm-hmm. preachers on TV and radio, mm-hmm. just to see what. And this one preacher said, if, if we if we vote for someone that's for abortion mm-hmm. and gay marriage, no, we sin. We sin mm-hmm. by voting for them. That's what they said. Mm-hmm. That's oh, their belief. I, I, I will. Anyway, I will be. Know. I'll be real honest with you. I I would agree with that. Now I know there's others that, that don't agree with that, but but I I would at this point that's the stance I would take well, that's is their we I'll just tell yeah. you what they we we would I, I I feel that as disciples of Jesus Christ that that if we do that the the only motivation for us doing that is is because we're going to get something out of it. We think that by putting that person in office, we're going to gain something. We have then left our faith and sided with the beast. And and that that's that's the way I feel about it's it. A at this point. So, that's the way they feel. Also. So yep. So now you can be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I want us to look uh through you know, last week uh I ended up by saying that that if you, when you read through the, the letters to the seven churches, there, there are 14 verses in there that are specifically directed towards praise and encouragement of the faithful, probably because they are being persecuted. There are also 17 verses that warn and command the comfortable that they need to repent. And so those seem to be the two issues that are there. And three of the seven letters show pretty clear evidence that, that these churches have kind of accommodated with the culture around them. Uh, and I want us to just kind of look look at these. Uh, Laodice, the church at Laodicea in chapter 3, the book of Revelation, seems to be a very prosperous and self-reliant church who is very comfortable with the Roman imperial culture. And if you look in chapter 3, verse 17... Uh, Jesus says through John, You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Uh, There's no evidence, when you read through the letter to the church at Laodicea, there's no evidence that that they're suffering any hardships there in Laodicea. in chapter 17, Revelation chapter 17, verse 2, and uh, you can put your finger there, and, and then we're going to read verse chapter 18, verse 9. Both of these verses show Rome as a prostitute who seduces the kings of the earth into committing adultery with her. Chapter 17, verse 2 says, With her the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with her wine and adulteries. In chapter 18, verse 9, when the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury, 
see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. And so uh, the purpose of these, this relationship seems to be that they will uh, share in this economic windfall uh, over the world. And let's go on in chapter 18. Let's go on and read some of the rest of that. Chapter 18, uh, we read verse 9. Verse 10 says, the, t- the terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Woe, woe, O great city, O Babylon, city of power. In one hour your doom has come. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood, And articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of of incense, myrrh, and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages, and bodies and souls of men. They will say, the fruit you longed for is gone from you. All your riches and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. The merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off, terrified at her torment. They will weep and mourn and cry out, Woe, woe, O great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea will stand far off. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, Was there ever a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads and with weeping and mourning cry out, Woe, woe, O great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour she has been brought to ruin. And so there's there's this language about those who profit because of the wealth of the empire, the wealth of the great city, the wealth of the of the nation state. Over in chapter 13, uh, verse 16 and 17, it says, He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. And so there's a a point in which in order to become wealthy and comfortable and gain riches and stuff, they had to basically sell themselves to the beast and become affiliated with, with the beast, receive the mark of the beast. And we'll talk more about what that means when we get to that uh, chapter in there. I don't think it means what we all have kind of been led to believe it means. Uh, and I, I'll, I'll just kind of throw this out there. You can mull on it until we get back there. Uh, again, in Revelation, you've got this contrast between the beast and God. And, and that's what the battle is, the beast or God. You belong to either the kingdom of the earth, which belongs to the beast, or you belong to the kingdom of God. Now, we have been, as Christians, marked, right? Don't the scriptures tell us that we have been marked with what? The seal of the Holy Spirit. The seal of the Holy Spirit. So those who belong to this kingdom are marked as belonging to this kingdom. I think what he's talking about here is if you're not marked with the seal that says that, that identifies you with this kingdom... If you've sold out, then you're marked with the seal that says that you belong to this kingdom. And so I, I don't think that it's tattoos anybody's going to get. I don't think it's MasterCard. I had a lady tell me one time that she would not have a MasterCard, only Visa, because she would not allow anything to be her master. <laughs> and that the MasterCard was the sign of the beast. And the numbers on that and, and barcodes. I remember when barcodes were the mark of the beast you know uh, but I think this is all dealing with who, who do you belong to and so anyway we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that but uh, the church in Laodicea seems to have been willing to enter into a relationship over here with the kingdom of the beast the kingdom of the of the earth 
so that they could become prosperous and live in complacency. And, and they have, therefore, in chapter uh, 3, verse 16, uh, he says, So because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. So their faith had become lukewarm. Uh, they were trying to live in both kingdoms or claim they lived in this one, but in actuality they lived in, in this kingdom. I guess if I'm going to keep pointing to the whiteboard, I ought to write something up here. Uh, world or beast as opposed to God. Now, so that's one illustration that we have of, of compromise that was taking place. Uh, but giving in to the prostitute of Rome isn't the only uh, kind of compromise. That's not the only way that, that people can compromise. Some of these churches, as we go through the letters, we're going to see had false teachers as their problem. Uh, the church in Pergamum had some members who followed the teaching of Balaam. And at Thyatira, the church was, uh, he chastises the church for tolerating uh, a prophetess that he symbolically names Jezebel. Now, we don't know exactly what either of these groups taught, but the result of their teaching is the same. They led the faithful uh, in, into committing sexual immorality and eating food sacrificed to idols. If you look in chapter 2, verse 14, uh, nevertheless, I have a few things to say against you. You have people there who hold to the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. And if you look over down in verse 20 of chapter 2, uh, Nevertheless, to the church at Thyatira, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teachings, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. And so, even though we don't know exactly what their teaching was, we do know the result of their teaching. Uh, the, the teaching evidently in, involved a comfort level with the Greco-Roman religious world that Jesus, in his letters to these churches, uh, Jesus doesn't agree with. Uh, according to Stevenson in his commentary, he says, the, the eating of food sacrificed to idols represents a participation in Greco-religious life that, from John's perspective, has crossed the line over into adultery. Now, and I want you to, to think about it. Go back with me into Acts chapter 15. In Acts chapter 15, uh, there's this letter that's written because there's a dis discussion and a debate uh, amongst the brothers, uh, especially, you know, what do we do with these Gentile brothers who eat stuff that we Jews don't eat and they don't wash their hands and they, you know, they don't stay at home on the Sabbath. In fact, some of them work on the Sabbath. What do we do with these guys? And so the council in Jerusalem sends a letter to them. And I want us to just look in verse 29, uh, Acts chapter 15, verse 29. One of the instructions that they gave to him, you are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. And so this has been a, a problem from the beginning of the church is the eating of meat sacrificed to idols. And so, uh, you know, there's, there's the debate that comes up, and I think Paul addresses this, you know, the eating of meat in the book of Romans. You know, eating meat in itself is not wrong. Eating meat that was sacrificed to animals or to, to the idols is not in itself wrong unless that leads you into participation with and acceptance of these pagan religions. And, and that was the problem is that they were evidently becoming too comfortable with just accepting these, the, the pagan religions and, and their practices. So that seems to be a part of the, 
accommodation, if you want to put it that way. They were just kind of becoming too comfortable with what was going on in the world around them. There, there are several references in these letters to sexual immorality, and uh, both of these uh, are criticized because these teachings lead to sexual immorality. And we need to keep in mind that sexual immorality in the Bible doesn't always mean strict, literal sexual immorality. A lot of times, uh, sexual immorality in the Bible is used as a metaphor for religious compromise, just kind of falling in with what's going on in the, in the religious or even pagan world around you. Uh, the Bible uses this language of adultery and fornication to talk about how God's people have become idolatrous and uh, compromised uh, with the world. Uh, turn over with me to Hosea in the Old Testament. Hosea deal really in a lot of ways the, the entire book of Hosea is about this same thing uh, but let's read in Hosea chapter 2 give you some time to turn there you go to Matthew and then just flip backwards several pages you'll eventually come to it But in Hosea chapter 2, beginning in verse 2, he says, Rebuke your mother, rebuke her, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. Let her remove the adulterous look from her face and the unfaithfulness from between her breasts. Otherwise I will strip her naked and make her as bare as on the day she was born. I will make her like a desert turned into parched land and slay her with thirst. I will not show my love to her children because they are the children of adulteries. Their mother has been unfaithful. She has conceived them in disgrace. She said, I will go after my lovers who give me food and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. Therefore, I will block her path with thorn bushes. I will wall her in so that she cannot find her way. She will chase after her lovers, but but not catch them. She will look for them, but not find them. She will say, I will go back to my husband as at first, for I was better off than now. She has not acknowledged that I was the one who gave her the grain, the new wine and oil, who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. Therefore, I will take away my grain when it ripens and my new wine when it is ready. Uh, and I read further than I wanted to stop at the end of verse 8. But, but this is God speaking of his people Israel. He called them out of Egypt. He provided for them everything that they needed. And yet once they got into that land, who did they turn to for their comfort and their support and, and everything they needed? The, the golden calf. And then after that even, they worshipped the, the Baals and the Asherah poles. And, and they just kind of, you know, if they saw the, the culture around them worshipping these gods and they were blessed, well, they thought, well, maybe that's the way to do it. Rather than trust in God, let's just do what they're doing so that we get what they get. Right. 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 Uh, would you would you say that we have uh, gotten to where we follow the things of the world world to provide for all of our needs? Can, what's that? At times with some people. Okay. Can you give me any examples? I remember years ago when uh, grocery stores were first allowed to sell alcohol. Mm-hmm. We had people in our church who were cashiers, and they said, you know, do I go ahead and scan that? Mm-hmm. For a while, they would ask somebody else to scan it, right. you know, because of their religious beliefs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's that. That's a, a that's a good example. Yeah. Right. And to don't even think twice about it a lot of times. To me, the big example is how we count on the government to take care of us instead of God to take care of us. Mm-hmm. Give me an example. 
no end of them. Um, <laughs> one that really bugs me is churches that when people come to them for help, go to the government to get the help mm -hmm. instead of helping the people. Mm -hmm. um, my own view is that Roosevelt did this to us when he took out of the church and put in the government as the supplier mm -hmm. of, uh, of benevolence. Okay. Thank you, sir. Trust us and we'll take care of you. Any other, any other examples you can think of? Yes, sir. Oh, you just knocked my camera off, and now it's probably only showing half of my face. But that's probably better. No, go ahead. <laughs> as long as it's good. When I, when I used to run my boat store, uh, we used to uh, do estimates for repair on lower units and such. And uh, the way the world was, uh, I'll bring it in, and, and you can mark up the estimate to take care of my deductible, and, and so I don't have to pay anything. And, you know, it's always a temptation mm -hmm. uh, to, to go that way, and, and, and he says, if you don't do this, I'm just going to go over here to this other dealership, because they said they would. I just like working with you. I said, well, I'm honest with you, and I'm honest with the insurance company. I will do it. Yeah. And I'd lose a lot of business, but God still takes care of it. Yeah. So, yeah. That's just... That, that's a great example, though, because a lot of times it, it's the little things that, in fact, sometimes we don't even think about them until somebody brings br points out, you know, that's really not even right. Uh, an, another example that I have is people uh, often will give me a, a, a copy of a movie or a CD that they've burned for me. You know, they taped a movie off of TV and they make a copy and they give it to me. Or they will, you know, have a CD that they know I like, and they'll burn me a copy and give it to me, and I'll tell them I, I won't take that. And they say, why? Because everybody, you know, burns CDs and, and stuff like that. And I said, because that's that person's property. If, if I don't buy it, they don't make their living. And if I take it without paying them, that's stealing, you know. So, but, but our, our culture just kind of encourages us to... You know, hey, there's a there's a better way. You know, you can profit. You can have more money, keep more money in your pocket if you'll just do the things that, that we do, which I think in some ways is what uh, got Israel off into, into their adulteries uh, there in the first place. An another place to look, look over in, in James. James chapter 4, verse 4. Because this looking at... Uh, adultery as a way that God's people leave his provision to accept the provision of, of other things, it, it, that's one of the huge issues that, that God's people have wrestled with from the very beginning. And in James chapter 4 verse 4, uh, James says, not, not, not Ephesians, it won't be in Ephesians because it's in James. Uh, James chapter 4 verse 4 James says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Uh, so when James says, if this is the kingdom you live in, as opposed to this one, you are an adulterous people. Okay, You've left your husband to go sleep with this. And, and I think that's a, a huge issue, has been from it for, for God's people from the very beginning, and I think it's something that we all wrestle with today. Uh, Sometimes we can better uh, visualize that if we think of the husband and wife situation, and I think that's why the Bible goes into such, mm -hmm. you know, you have a jealous God. Why well, God can't be jealous? Well, yeah, because you left him and, and you went to... Uh, something else to be your priority. Mm -hmm. And that's the same with a husband and wife situation. Sure. Right. If my husband leaves me to find another woman as a priority, uh, yeah, yeah, we're having trouble here. Yeah. And we don't visualize that so much when when God refers to it because, you know, after all, he's not standing in front of me. Right. 
Uh, and, and if we can visualize that as a husband and wife situation, which that's exactly mm -hmm. what the Bible wants you to do, right. then yeah, God's not happy because you've forsaken him to do whatever you please to do, whether mm -hmm. it be sports, whether it be camping, whether it be fishing, whether it be shopping, or I'll get shopping. Um, <laughs> <laughs> whatever that be, you have forsaken him right. to do as you choose to do. Right. And you can't do that in a marriage either because right. it's not going to last long. And, and, and let me ask this question. I mean, you, you're on to something that, that I think is really important, and that's this illustration, because this is the illustration God uses all throughout Scripture, is that he's the husband, and, and his people are his bride. Uh, Christ is the husband, and the church is the bride, and, and that's the illustration that's used forever, you know, all throughout there. But let, let me ask you, uh, ladies, if your husband leaves you for another man, why does that bug you so much? Uh, for, well, or, or these days, these these days, these days. Yeah. Next question. Yeah. Leaves you for another woman. Let's because because I, I was gonna do it, you know, for men. But but let's say for 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 women. If if your husband leaves you for another woman, why, why does that bug you so much? Okay, and and why does that? Is it just because he didn't keep his word, or why else does it bug you? Because God says we join together as one. Okay, but I, I want to get some feeling type stuff here. In a marriage situation, that spouse, you are to be that spouse's first priority. Yes. And that's where I want to be. I don't want to be number two wife. I don't want to be number three wife, and I don't want to be, I don't want to come in as second and third. Okay. And and so when we do that to God, and we make him number two and number three, then he feels the same way as any spouse does that's chosen to put another uh, individual into that relationship. Mm -hmm. And he has every right to feel that way. Okay. Because we took him on as, as our Savior, and we gave him that number one central spot. And now we're taking it away. Same thing with a, a, a husband and wife relationship. Okay. I want to be number one. I don't want to be two and three. Well, quit being so selfish, Cindy. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Why did you bring this up? <laughs> I have a purpose, and hopefully we're going to get to it here in just a second. The loyalty that that wife has given that husband is being disrespected. Now, Absolutely. the loyalty that God has given us by giving us his son... When we turn to something else, we just respect that. And, and you're, you're getting on to the point that I, I wanted to get to. I've talked to women who've, who've had their husbands leave, and one of the common statements, and, and this goes for, for guys too whose wife leaves, I gave everything to that person. I've given X number of years to my life to provide for that person, cooked meals, fixed clothes, was there to raise the kids. I've given everything to for that person. I, I love that person enough that I gave my own life for them. And for them to just throw it away and, and, and not, even, uh, not even have any care or compassion of everything that I've given to them, that's what hurts, right? Amen? Yeah. And, and, and now take that from God's perspective. I've given you everything. I've provided everything you will ever possibly need. And now you're off sleeping with this beast. Turn to the world. Yeah. I think it boils down to a contrast you know, between selfishness and selflessness. You know, when it comes down to relationships, you know, particularly when you're you know, having a relationship with the father. In, in some ways, though, and I, I agree with you because we always say, you know, that if, if a guy leaves his wife for another woman, mm -hmm. there's a selfishness in there. But he got with this woman in the first place in some ways for a selfish reason. He wanted someone to meet his needs and he's looking for someone else to, to meet those needs. But it's a matter uh, really of saying, you know, and with, with us, with God, we enter into this relationship in some ways for selfish reasons. We, we want God to provide for us, right? I mean, we all know we, we need air, right? We need food, right? 
we need love, right? We need companionship, he right? everything. And God provides that. And so then when we say, well, I'm not quite getting as much food as I'd like, so I'll go over here and I'll join up with the world. And I'll do, start doing things from the world's way of doing things, and i got more food in my belly now. And uh, so what we're doing then is we say, I, I really don't trust that you're going to take care of me. Somebody else can meet my needs better than you can. And so that is one of the ways that that adultery is, is used in the Bible to describe uh, idolatry. And those in the church in Thyatira who are following the teachings of Jezebel are described as committing adultery. Uh, and the joining of, of Rome and the, the kings of the earth we saw earlier, the, the joining up with them by God's people is also described as adultery. Uh, in chapter 17, verse 1 and 2. Of Revelation, I'm sorry. Revelation 17, uh, verse 1 and 2. One of the seven angels who had seven bowls came and said to me, to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. With her the kings of the earth committed adultery. And the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Uh, down in verse 4 and 5. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. Uh, this is the title. This title was written on her forehead, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and the abominations of the earth. Uh, chapter 18, verse 3, which I think we read earlier. Uh, for all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. And so adultery is, is a term that's used very often for the joining of God's people or the lure of the world to pull God's people into these adulteries. But uh, it's also possible that the references to sexual immorality uh, may be explicit sexual behavior. Uh, the teachings of Balaam and Jezebel that we read about here uh, as leading to sexual immorality really may lead to a very lax moral standard uh, that results in God's people committing inappropriate sexual activity. Uh, sexual immorality occurs in other places in, in Revelation. In chapter 9, verse 21... Revelation 9.21, he said, Nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, and their sexual immoralities, or their thefts. And the way that sexual immorality is grouped there with real physical action seems to be that, that those were, were literal sexual immoralities that are taking place there. Chapter 21, verse 8. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, will pl will play, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And so, again, though that's in the context of physical actions that are done, so it seems that those probably are uh, literal uh, idolatries or sexual immoralities. Uh, chapter 22, verse 15. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. And so the term could mean that, and, and you know, it, it is known and I I don't I'm no expert on this but but we do know that some of the pagan religions had a sexual part to them and so it could be that as as the members in this church have have kind of given in and, and kind of accepted some of this other cultural stuff that the sexual immorality that's in, involved in there is is too uh, is, is a part of it as well now that was the second bell Okay. 
So we'll pick up here talking about sex again next week. So, unless, anybody have any questions, real quick, before we leave? All right, then you are dismissed. We'll pick up there next week.